Okay, welcome back. Um, what we're going to do today is talk about text. Um, it, InDesign is a great program for applying text. What you're going to do, or at least when you're using InDesign, you're using it to design things like magazines or newsletters or layout, different things like that. It's a layout uh, application, and text plays a major role in it. And so what we're going to do is start out by looking at what InDesign can do and what it can't do. Some of some of its advantages and some of its limitations. Let's start out though first of all um, by examining a little bit of text here. Now I'm going to go ahead and get my text tool and I'm going to click and drag. You'll notice that there are other choices in there. Um, there's type on a path tool and the standard type tool. And we'll go ahead and review those. You'll notice that the control panel as soon as you select that text or make that text box um, will allow you to change the font, change characteristics about it. You can also go to Window, Type and Tables and see different sorts of text options, but we won't worry about that right now. Um, first things first, I'm going to go ahead and fill this with just some, some placeholder text. Now what placeholder text does is just sort of like Greek text to let you see generally what type is going to look like within there. So by going to Type, fill with placeholder text, it's going to give us just this Greek font. Now, just like in Microsoft Word or just any other program, if you want to change this, you're going to select type like that. You can click once to establish where your cursor is, click twice to select Word, three times in order to select a line, or four times to select a whole paragraph, or Command A, which will select everything. Um, right here is our alignment. This is aligned left. Aligned center, aligned right. Um, here we've got justified, then we've got justified with the baseline of that paragraph centered, and forced. Now you'll see that in forced specifically, you're going to see some really wonky things going on with type. But in in uh, justified type, there typically is rivers. In fact, if you squint your eyes right now, you can kind of see these black lines going through, or these darker lines going through. Those are called rivers. And those are not necessarily desirable to have. So just be aware of that alignment. Now, I'm going to enlarge this box just a little bit because what we're going to do now is go through and work with some of these other options. Our font right now is Minion Pro. I can select all that and change that, of course, to whatever font I want to do, in this case, Mona Lisa. Um, and this is going to be our size. We've got pre-formatted sizes. Um, now you'll notice that when I make it too big, I've got a little red square right here with a plus. That means I have more text than I have space. And so I've got to make adjustments for that to make sure that it all fits. Um, I've either got to make my type smaller, or I've got to make my text box a little bigger. Now each font at a specific size has what we call an X height. That's the distance from baseline to baseline. And that's measured right here. Now, this is called your leading, or it's the space between lines of type. And originally what it was, was they would set type, lead type, and then if you want to increase space between the lines of type, you'd put little slivers of lead between each section of type. And so if you said, well, I want to add lead, that means I want to make that space a little bit bigger. So that's where that phrase comes from. Well, each font as a specific size has a specific pre-program leading. But I can enlarge that, which makes that more formal by increasing that, or I can make it smaller. It's going to make it a little tougher to read, but a little more, maybe a little more avant-garde that way. Um, or I could just switch back to auto. All right? Now there's some other functions here as well. For example, this right here gives everything all caps. Um, this is upper and lower caps. You can underline it. Or I can strike through. Strike through is usually used with a legal document to say, okay, this is the area that I want to change in this contract right here. And I'm going to type new stuff in. And so you have that area that's, that's struck through. Now, just because you can do it, it's like putting a pink flamingo in your front yard. Just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you should. And so as a rule, you want to try to avoid some of these uh, characteristics like strike through and stuff like that. 
Um, however, in some cases they are useful. For example, if we type in H2O, um, let's increase our size here just a little bit so we can see it better. Um, I might select that too and make it look like that. So now I have the molecular equation for water. I might want to put uh, a reference to a specific subnote. So maybe this is 3. I can give this a superscript like that. And if we zoom in here, you'll see now that we've got that right up there. So there are some advantages to it and there's some uses to it, but be careful with it. Um, let's go ahead and select that type again. Now we can select individual parts, go ahead and change the color. In this case, I'm going to go to CMYK and make it, you know, red or something like that. Um, and if I want to switch back, I can just select this. There are other options as far as type as well. In this case, we've got our kerning, okay, which is the individual space between letters. Um, think about it as a corn kernel. If you get one of those, like popcorn, get one of those stuck in your teeth, it pushes those two teeth apart a little bit. This is a tracking, and what that does is it affects the overall spacing of all the letters. This is your vertical scale, and this is your horizontal scale. What that does is it stretches the letters out. Now let me show you what I mean by that over here. Let's go ahead and put um, the word David in all caps. This will be a good one to actually look at. We're going to make this 72 dots per inch so that we can see what's going on. Let me move this box down a little bit. Now I can grab this and drag it like this. I'm going to put this here like that. Now I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit so we can see what's going on. If you look at this, there's sort of some weird spacing in here. Even though the letter size is, or the letters are all roughly programmed to fit certain ways, um, the problem here is that because this letter slopes away, that D slopes away and that A slopes away, it seems like there's a big gap there. Same with the A and the V. So in this case, we can select the space between those two letters. So I want to adjust this space. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to subtract or decrease that kerning until it fits. Um, I can also just highlight and type it. Do the same here. I'm going to go in and adjust this. Bring those a little closer together so as I squint, this spacing feels a little bit more accurate. I might even do that between the D and the I. Now once that's done, I can select all of this, and adjust my tracking, and it will track everything together with that new space that's going on between that. So I can go in and kind of fine tune my text and my spacing there. Now you want to do that with headlines and and areas where you've got really a lot of emphasis in text, but, but avoid that um, for a big paragraph of type unless you're getting paid by the hour, okay? Um, now, let's look at this right here. This represents our horizontal scale. And so what it will do is it will stretch out that text. Now, usually the maximum you want to do is about 10%. If you stretch it any more than 10%, what happens is it starts to distort the letter form. Let me show you what I mean. See this space right here? As I stretch that vertically, that also stretches this, and it changes the letter form. Letter forms are designed to look a specific way um, at a specific size. And so if you start stretching that, then what happens is it causes some problems. The same if I take this letter and I change its horizontal scale from 100 to say 150, see how it stretches that out. So you want to try to avoid those things, okay? Now the I, we can make the I, if we want to adjust the baseline shift on that, okay, we can make it increase or decrease. And then some letters, we can go in and we can adjust the skew of them. Now some fonts don't have an italicized version so this is sort of a cheating way to be able to get those italics. Okay. Um, now I'll give you an example of when we might use a baseline shift. Let's say we have uh, a superscript here and we're gonna put it like that. Um, right now I'm gonna decrease the, 
the tra or the kerning on this and bring it a little closer together. And then to bring that up just a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and change my baseline shift. Bring that up. Oops. Bring that up like that. Just to give a little bit different. Another example of when we may want to use that kerning or that tracking is to be able to adjust things a little bit. For example, um, it's usually pretty undesirable to have a little widow right here. In fact, we'll do it this way so that we don't break out of that page. Um, we're just going to take some text out of there. Um, like that. That's usually pretty undesirable. So what we might do is select that and either adjust our tracking in so it all comes up on one line. Or like in this case, I don't want this big, huge space right here. Especially, let's say I've got a hard return like that. I don't want this big, huge space. So I might select a large area here and just add a little bit of tracking in that just so that we can spread out that space a little bit more. Um, just for aesthetics and to make it a little more desirable, a little easier to Let's discuss a limitation. Let's start out, I'm going to just type this in. Um, I want this automatically to start out at you know 24 bit points. So let's ask, oops, ask not what your country can do for you, period, ask what um, you can do for your country, JFK, John F. Kennedy. All right, now let's look at this a little bit. We have to examine what we have for spelling errors here. Now. Of words, we have one misspelling actually, and that's the only one right there. Um, that's not what you can do for your country. Okay, that's the only misspelled word, I'm sorry. But we have three misspellings. We have this one and this one, because within the context, those words are, are spelled incorrectly. Ask not, that would be a not, like a rope, what your country can do, so Mountain Dew or whatever for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Well, we've got that, but now let's go to edit spelling. Here we go, check spelling. Um, what it's showing us is that we only have one spelling error. We'll change that. That changes to JFK. We're going to do so we're skip. It says, ah, oh, you're done. And so, the problem is that there's a misspelling, or there are misspellings there in context. So, InDesign is not a text checking, or it can be used as a as a word processing document, but it really isn't one. Um, what I would normally do is, if I have somebody typing something, or if I've got stuff to type, I'm going to do it in a word processing program like Microsoft Word. It's going to check the context um, and going to make sure all the punctuation, everything is accurate. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go ahead and take that and import it as text. So for example, I can click and highlight right here or create a text box and go to File, Place, and normally it would place pictures, but now I'm going to go to my desktop. Marley was dead. Here we go. This is from um, The Christmas Carol. Let's go ahead and open that. And there, and it gives us our text um, here that it's going to go ahead and, and bring that in as a Word document. Now you'll notice right down here, there's a little red uh, box, and what that means again is that we have more text than we have space. Well, I can click on that with the arrow, and you'll see we get a little thumbnail of text. And what that means is that we can create another box, and that text will automatically flow. So, for example, I'm going to go ahead and make this smaller. And that text is going to flow 
from one box to the next because we've loaded in here. In fact, I can have a box already created, like so, and then get my arrow, click there, and load it in that box right there. And it will automatically do it for me. I can have a circle, and I can either start typing in there with my text tool, or I could select that red box, Oops, click on that, and drag it, and bring it in here, and it will load that. So I can bring those from space to space and move them around. I can change the background color of those text boxes, make my type in there, you know, a, a different color. I guess we'll do white. So I have all of those options in there. Now, we're going to learn more about this in the second part of this video. This will be a two-part video. The next part that we look at, we're going to look at having text flow around lines and also having text